Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. This week we're going to talk about a recent report that the IBM Center for Applied Insights conducted. And basically to obtain a global snapshot of security leaders' strategies and approaches, they went out and with double-blind interviews talked to 138 security leaders, uh, IT line of business executives and those responsible for security in their enterprise. And today we're going to talk a little bit about their findings. So joining me, uh, first off, is Jack Danahy, who is the Director of Advanced Security at IBM and the founder of Outs Labs. Welcome, Jack. Well, thank you very much, Caleb. And David Jarvis, a senior consultant with the IBM Center for Applied Research, uh, for Applied Insights. Welcome, David. Thanks a lot, Caleb. So, so, David, first off, what is the Center for Applied Insights all about? Well, the uh, the center, the IBM Center for Applied Insights, is a uh, a group within um, IBM's uh, kind of marketing communications organization, and we're responsible for generating um, really fact-based thought leadership material. So, you know, we look across a variety of topics, a variety of industries, across all the things that impact IBM, and, and we work with um, clients inside the company, inside IBM, to uh, develop pieces of thought leadership that, that puts out a, a compelling fact-based point of view. So, so what was the focus of this survey, and you know, why, why did you guys do it? Sure, sure. Um, it, it really started last fall um, when some of our executives approached us and, you know, they were hearing a lot of, of stories from clients and they were getting a lot of feedback from some of our clients at various, um, you know, industry events. And, and they were talking, more and more people were talking about security and they were asking a lot of, um, you know, these executives' opinions and what IBM was doing and what we thought and, and you know, and so... Um, the execs came to us and, and asked us to kind of take a look at security from an independent point of view and really see if we were at a, a kind of a tipping point or a turning point, um, you know, within information security. If the the world was in such a state where we needed to kind of uh, it needed to be pushed in a particular direction, or you know, things the threat or the technology had gotten to a point where we needed to kind of look at it differently. Um, and so over the, the course of a couple months, you know, we talked with a lot of people, obviously, inside IBM, and we talked with a lot of people, um, you know, outside IBM, and, you know, got their viewpoints, uh, you know, took a look at the market, saw what was happening, and, and really thought that, it, you know, we felt that it actually was, you know, undergoing a pretty significant transformation. And so we wanted to focus on security leaders, CISOs, uh, CSOs, and, and the like, and, um, you know, put together a, a piece of, of thought leadership, do a survey, see what was going on, um, and try to really test our hypotheses. You know, were things changing? Um, you know, were, you know, you know, we knew kind of the pressure was increasing. We knew that, you know, a lot of the kind of leading information security leaders were seeing things happening differently. So we wanted to, to test it and see what was really happening. So, so we're going to talk a lot today about, CISOs, which, you know, for those that may not be familiar, is Chief Information Security Officer. Um, you know, what, what is your, and Jack, maybe you want to handle this one, what, what's your, you know, are CISOs becoming a, a common position to find in enterprises? Well, I think one of the biggest things that's happened that's been really interesting is that as security has moved out of uh, a role of being a highly technical highly sort of tactical cleanup focus kind of job and is becoming a more strategic question that gets asked much earlier in sort of the development of a business or process, we're finding that the role has changed a ton. You know, in industries where they already understood the importance of security, you're finding CISOs uh, are becoming a center place uh, where organizations can go to ask a variety of different questions, right? Everything going from, hey, am I doing enough to protect customer privacy? to what am I going to do if there is an attack on industries just like mine? And so for industries that have had security concerns for a long time, the ones that you'd expect to see, uh, things like financial services and governmental entities, you know, in financial services as, as a rule, we've seen a lot uh, of existence of CISOs for some time. But in other industries where the introduction of technology and as a result, the introduction of security for that technology is relatively new. And by that, I mean sort of in their infrastructure or in the way they run their businesses, it's become a much more pressing factor in maybe the last 10, 15 years. We haven't yet seen the growth of that many CISOs because the organizations themselves 
are just evolving to the point where technology is more than a decision that gets made sort of on a unit by unit basis and it becomes part of the infrastructure which underpins the success of the organization as a whole. So depending upon the industry you're in, uh, there may or may not be lots of CISOs. And, and one of the reasons why it was really important for us, uh, those of us who, who are thinking about security a lot with an IBM, to work uh, with David's organization to get some you know, real-world data is because the questions we were getting were starting to change. You know, we weren't being asked anymore, hey, what should I do about cryptography here? Or how can I better manage my firewall there? It was, it was I'm going before my board of directors to talk about the way we're mitigating our data protection and loss strategy. Or we've had a critical breach and you know, we have information we're concerned with about millions of customers that may have gone out into the wild someplace. What do we do to solve that? And the nature of these questions becoming so much more strategic and so much less focused on individual components of technology made us really wonder, right? The, it's not just the, the instances that are changing, the individuals are changing, the successful CISOs are changing. And that's where this research has been super helpful for us. And I, I think it's been helpful for others uh, in, in maybe some of these developing markets who are trying to figure out what does it mean to become a CISO and how do I change my job. So, so the role starts to move from, you know, and I think the somewhat parochial view many have had of the security person is, you know, Kind of in the, it's a constant expense that it's always difficult to understand what the reward is, and, and you know a big part of what you're suggesting comes out of this is the movement from looking at this like an expense item towards the movement of thinking about security as an integral part of the organization's strategy. Well, I think that's true. I think that if I you know, go back and I, I look at security funding, you know, it used to be you'd see a real influx in funding when something awful happened in a company, right? And I think what we've seen is that the the public perception of the existence and the reality and the prevalence of these styles of attack and the styles of these breaches has made them to start thinking about it more like a business concern. You know, people all the time worry about things like flood and fire and theft and catastrophic loss. And that's because you sort of see them, right? And you read about them, and they're part of our consciousness. So, you know, even though you know maybe a, a flood would be rare where I am, I recognize it'd be pretty silly for me not to have some form of thinking around it. What will I do? How will my business run? Um, how do I guarantee my assets, right, against that style of damage? And I think what's happened is we have seen the introduction of the same style of thinking around this new style of threat, right? Which is which is the one that's focused on on these data elements and on the integrity of them. So yeah. were there, you know, now, now that you've completed the report, which, by the way, is available online and the, the link is in the description of this podcast, were there any surprises in the report, things that, you know, might surprise, uh, you know, a CEO or a CISO or others that are working with them? I, I think that there were a, a couple of surprises, um, and it's the surprises when you talk to people have been different depending on, on who they are and kind of what, what industry they're in or what approach they're taking. Um, and I'll let, I'll let Jack talk to what surprised him. Things that surprised me, and actually going back to what Jack was talking about, kind of this an insurance-centric um, kind of approach to, to security, is that looking at the budgets, actually, um, I mean, we knew that this was – uh, you know, on the radar of a, of a lot of business leaders and, and boards and, and the C-suites are starting to pay a lot more attention um, for a variety of different reasons, you know, just, you know, more publicized attacks and, and just becoming more of an information-centric business is, is causing them to look at security a bit more. But, um, you know, we found that uh, about two-thirds of the respondents in the survey expected to have increased budgets over the next couple of years. And it wasn't just a couple percentage points. It was, you know, definitely uh, the majority were going to see double-digit increases. And, um, you know, a small percentage was actually going to see uh, even even greater than 50% um, increases in their budget over the next two years. So there is this, I think, acknowledgement by senior business leaders that, that it is a very important problem and can really disrupt a lot of things in their business. And so I think they're willing to put the resources behind it. Um, I think that was one of the things. The thing that surprised me, not that the uh, that the budgets were going up, but just the the fact that the majority. I mean, this you know a very large percentage of of the respondents you know said that their budgets were going to go up and by a pretty significant amount. I don't know, Jack. What did, what surprised you? I think the most. 
Well, what was what was really interesting to see was the increased sort of the realization uh, among these leaders that the external threat was the thing that they had to worry about. You know, for a lot of years, if you talk to people in the security community about what should I be most worried about, uh, it was always the insider. You know, and this is not to minimize the damage that uh, a motivated insider can do. Um, but it, it, I think typically it was also sometimes the reason people gave the answer was because it was a attractive, tractable problem. You know, by its definition, I understand the scope and the sort of the finite nature of the insider. And the external threat is huge. It, the permutations of, you know, bad actors and attack types and threat surface makes it a really, really complicated problem. And I think, you know, that combined with the type of damage, as they say, a, a trusted insider can do, that was where people applied a lot of their emotion and their passion. I've got to worry about that insider. And a lot of the technology choices and architecture choices that were made focused on that. And, and the external, while viewed as, as perhaps dangerous, was always viewed as um, not necessarily as concerning as the internal. And one of the reports, you know, results in saying that the external threats are a bigger challenge, right, than internal threats was uh, was definitely a change in, in the perception of these leaders from my perspective, right? And it was a surprise. You know, and I think it's very true. I think maybe part of it is because it's difficult now, given the sort of the permeability of the network itself, that internal and external look an awful lot alike these days, right? It's very few, very few organizations feel completely isolated from from um, the external world and from the untrusted components of it. We see, you know, where the other big concerns was coming through was around mobile computing, right? And that's another example of sort of really creating a very, very porous, you know, um, intermediary surface through which all these people connect. And so, for me, that was really, really interesting, and I think it, it shows a, a level of awareness on the part of these leaders that they have to start thinking about this really complex problem. Um, how do they prioritize what they're going to work on? How do they, you know, factor in higher levels of risk or higher level of asset value and start doing real math, right, real business kinds of math around how they apply protection? So I think that was a, a, that was a really interesting part from the study for me. So when I look at the you know, kind of the conclusions. You you spent a lot of time in the report talking about the maturity of organizations, and you actually even broke it down into kind of three categories, influencers, protectors, and responders. Do, do you feel that, uh, you know, how, talk to me a little bit about kind of the the maturity you saw in the organizations you surveyed, and you know, what I found interesting about breaking this down between influencers, protectors, and responders is you were not only talking about how mature is their security posture, but also to a certain degree how mature is their thinking about security. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. We, we did try to do that. Um, you know, it, it's tough to assess an, uh, an enterprise's kind of security posture, and, and so we had to come up with a way to do it um, where they told us, you know, what they thought about how they were approaching security as, a, as opposed to us doing some sort of independent assessment, which, you know, would, would be pretty impossible. But, you know, you're, you're right on, I think, when we looked at two different areas. We looked at kind of a tactical approach and we looked at a strategic approach, you know, really kind of how they thought about security. Um, and from the tactical perspective, we looked at, you know, something that, you know, everyone's worried about. Okay, how prepared are you for a breach or a security incident? Um, you know, let us know, is it, you know, are you not prepared at all, or you think that, you know, if, if a breach happened that you could handle it, no problem. Um, and as you might expect, I, I think that the, you know, the kind of the response to that shifted more towards um, people being very prepared for, for a breach. So in general, um, as a whole, people were a bit more mature for that, that breach preparedness. But if you look on this, the strategic side, you, we asked them to you know, analyze their kind of overall approach to security, their overall maturity, um, and really, you know, assess, are, are you adequate or do you think you're world class um, in your approach? And for that one, um, you know, it shifted a bit more towards the lower end of the maturity spectrum. So when you kind of combine those two together, you look at both the strategic and the tactical approach and have people tell us, well, how do you think you're doing? How do you think you're doing compared to others? Um, we could see this kind of uh, this grouping between these three different groups where the influencers were, were very mature, very confident in their ability. You know, they thought they were running a world-class organization. They could handle anything that kind of uh, came their way. And the, uh, the responders were, you know, a bit more um, 
uh, less confident. I, you know, they didn't really, they might have just been starting, they might have gone through a, a pretty radical transformation in their security uh, in their security team, they might still be building their capabilities up. Um, so that, that's kind of how it broke down. And, and then, you know, we dug into the details around, you know, what made them feel more confident? You know, what were they doing? How were they structured? How were they funded? What did they do on a day-to-day basis that, that really put them in that position? So so what, what I what find fascinating about that is their willingness to acknowledge that they may not be as mature as they need to. I mean, you know, security is one of those things where, you know, everybody always has a desire to sleep well at night, right? So they, they certainly like to think that what they've done is adequate, and what you're suggesting here is that maybe we're starting to finally move into a mode where people ha- have a greater self-awareness of where they're solid and where they're not. I mean, if, if I take a look at the, one of the really interesting pieces of that confidence of how, you know, both the acknowledgement happens, the planning, and that sense of self, I think it equates really, really neatly with one of the strategies for these, these folks becoming more mature and the organizations maturing more in terms of security leadership, and it's all around communication, right? You know, universally you'll see in these results that the teams who felt most confident were the ones who had networks of peers, right, who were doing similar sorts of jobs. They had good relationships with both the technical community in their own shop and the business community inside their own shop. They were consistently communicating their thoughts on risk, and they were being solicited for their opinions on the impacts of various decisions that were being made by the business. And so, you know, if I, if I were to, you know, shade this conversation in a direction, you know, if somebody's looking for the takeaway for what does differentiate you know, these influences, you know, the, the highest order of security provider, you know, down to the, the leaders who were really focused on responding, it is that idea of communication, communicating ahead of events, you know, communicating their concerns, communicating security priorities, communi- communicating metrics, you know, among various groups so you can decide prioritization, and then communicating amongst their peers, internal to the organization and externally, so you get a great sense of confidence about where you truly stand, and you don't get that sort of uncomfortable feeling in the pit of your stomach that you don't really know what's going on. So I think that, you know, as we look at these organizations changing, that ability to communicate, that willingness to communicate is one of the prime factors. So, so the majority of respondents indicated that security is gaining kind of that increased leadership attention, it's becoming more and more of a regular boardroom discussion. And, Jack, you talked a lot about, you know, kind of how the conversation is starting to change, you know, bringing in metrics, things like that. Are there, for the non-security professional listeners, so let's say the, the CEO, the board member, you know, one of the things I find is they want to assess where, is, where am I at from a security perspective? How mature is my organization? Are there sets of questions or behaviors or things that that CEO or board member can start to ask for? I mean, I I think one good exercise that I've suggested to a few clients is, you know, ask for some reports. You know, show me the failed intrusion attempts over the last 24 hours. Show me, you know, what's hitting our network. And, you know, even though you may not understand the report, if people can show you that data fairly quickly, if they have their pulse on it and they can get to it easily, you're probably much better off than when it creates a, you know, a, a two-week uh, undertaking to try to go find the data and build the report for the person that asked. You're probably not as well off. Would you, would you agree with that? And are there kind of questions that the non-security professional can start to ask? Well, I, I mean, I, I definitely, I, I would say that Asking the right questions of the security folks is definitely the place to start, right? Not sitting there passively, you know, as though you're being reported something that everybody understands very well. I'm a little hesitant on the idea of asking them for some reports because if, if there's one thing we know in security that, there's, that there is more data than anyone can ever use, right? And without, That's very a, true. With, without a lot of context, sometimes it's hard. And I think it would be, you know, a, a diligent board would find themselves hard-pressed to understand whether – the reporting that they are getting is really germane to the interests of the business that they're worried about. You know, what, one of the things that we found to be really super enlightening is when boards of directors and senior management teams, you know, go to the security, the security teams and say, hey, listen, can you please tell me, you know, where in the organization you're doing work, right? So sort of where have we actually engaged with the security team? Because I think a lot of times the, the security folks are working, you know, wherever they can, right, where they have access to. I think that 
the board and the, and the other team are trusting that the security teams are doing what they should. But frankly, there's a lot of parts of the business that are just going to be invisible, right, to, to a team coming in from the outside. You know, and so you can create sort of a map, and, and I've recommended this a couple of times, to, to create a matrix of sort of where systems are, where data exists where my business is being run from, where my financials or my customer data is being stored, and then have the discussion with the security team. Right? So first you have those organizations. Right? You're the finance team, you're the sales team, whatever. Tell us where you're doing all your stuff and where your services come from, where you store it. And then ask the security team, all right, I want you to cross-match this. I want you to tell me which of the organizations are you working with and exactly what are you doing. And so as opposed to getting down to a technology discussion and looking at more granular data, now I get to do this really simple overlay. I get to say, all right, security team is working in these 16 places. I know from this other report, which was not related to security but was related to our business, that there are 30 places that I should be worried about. Let's find out what's going on in the other 14 places. So at a very high level, I can treat it with that same sort of overlay mathematics that we use in any other industry, uh, other area of business. You know, tell me about your capital reporting. Tell me about your employee assets. You know, we measure things all the time. And if I can make this look a little bit more like that kind of business measure, I think we find these teams being more successful in identifying really areas of exposure that they hadn't really thought about before. Yeah. So I start to I, orient I, the view of the risk towards, you know, where, what are the areas where you're spending money in your business in general? Yeah. What, are the, what are the critical portions of your business? So if you had, you know, a, after doing this research, if you had a couple minutes with a CEO – what would be your top line recommendations of things for them to focus on? I think um, I'll go. <laughs> I'll try to go first. Um, In the deafening yeah, silence, David will go first. Yeah, I know. I was like, what are you going to focus on? Well, it, well, I think one of the things that, that's key. Um, if, if I was talking to a CEO and, and asking what they should focus on, um, it, you know, I think it's really em, empowering this, the uh, the security organization to work with the business. I think a lot of things that Jack was uh, that Jack was saying. You know, was spot on. This fact of, of communication and you know reaching out across the organization and making connections to you know where the important data is and talking with those people that are responsible for it, uh, I, I think is extremely important. And uh, I go back to a, a panel that that Jack and I uh, Jack and I were, were both on, and one of the people on that panel were, were talking about how important it was for their day to day job as a security leader. Um, to educate the the business leaders, you know, they they basically had a, a you know a roadshow and they would go around and and make it relevant um, to them and tell them why it's important and why they should care and why they should worry about it and why it and why it's a business issue and not a, just a pure technology issue. And I think getting that buy-in and, and making the CEO I think aware of that, um, you know, would be extremely helpful and I think you know in the long run would the secure the enterprise better. Yeah, for, from my perspective, if I'm the CEO, I, I, I would actually take the CEO down memory lane for about 30 seconds, right, and talk to them about the way in which businesses change the view of technology. You know, today, the CIO is a common construct. Everybody understands it. You know, if you look at business leaders and their investment today, most of them will say that technology and investment in technology is the primary way in which they're going to move their business forward, right? And so... That's because what ended up happening was at some, a certain point in time, businesses said, you know, this technology, this isn't just the way that, you know, Bill puts the car together or that, you know, Marge puts together the financial planning. It's, this is inherent to our entire business. And if I could unify my thinking about technology, I could put a sea change in terms of the way that I'm profitable, the way that I manage my own productivity, really the way that I drive my business and evolve it more quickly over the course of time. And I think if I can get that CEO to view security in that same light, that this isn't a piecemeal process, that it can't be done most productively or efficiently in a bunch of different ways in a bunch of different places. But instead, I start measuring it and managing it centrally as a priority, the same way I do things like financial systems, right? Then I can really very much change the security really wholesale across the organization by focusing on this as a characteristic of the different groups inside my organization, as opposed to sort of its own organization with its tentacles hanging all over the place. Now I can find a way to get a series of things like reports, like you mentioned earlier, Caleb, a series of outputs that are meaningful to me in the same way that I get capital and expense um, reports from every one of my divisions. They're all speaking a common language. They're all reporting according to the same framework, and they're all giving me the same kind of data so it allows me to make an educated business decision. So if I'm in front of that CEO and I've got two minutes, I'm going to try to get them to believe that security is not a separate function, that security is not a separate pool of people. Security is a characteristic of every decision that they make, 
every investment that they make, every person that they hire, every business that they acquire, every market that they go into will be impacted by the security policies that they put together. So thinking about it as a characteristic and then managing it the same way I manage profitability as a characteristic, I think will make them a lot more successful. So, so bring together the the educational aspect, the communications aspect, and interweave it into this corporate strategy just like anything else is. You know, it, it's it's interesting in listening to this conversation. You know, I, I feel like there would have been a dialogue just like this about 15 years ago about the role of the CIO, right, in how, you know, eventually CIOs became a much more strategic part of the organization versus kind of a cost center off on the side. And it, it sounds like we're, we've taken a, a little lap down memory lane here just as we start talking about security. I think that's exactly right. So, um, you know, just to remind everyone, the full report is available on ibm.com slash smarter slash CAI slash security. That's ibm.com slash smarter slash CAI slash security. So, uh, Jack, any kind of closing comments or other things you wanted to mention? I really would recommend if individuals who are paying attention uh, to this area and who are interested in figuring out how they move the organization forward, part of this will also move them forward, right? Take a look at this report. David's team did a great job of getting really tactical as well as strategic advice into it around the differences between someone whose day-to-day job is mainly putting on fires and having stones thrown at them to being a person who sits at the table as the organization decides what to do in a new business because they're going to bring that characteristic of security, that that security component of this plan to the table. It's a better job. It feels better. You're not cleaning up after the elephant all the time. And the organization as a whole, I think, is better because they take a more strategic view, a more integrated view of security as they're making any decision throughout it. So I'd really recommend take a look at it because it's a way to improve not only security, but I think your impact on the organizations that you care about. Uh, so, so one last question for David, and then, David, I'll, I'll ask you for some closing comments as well. Did, did you look at or assess where this, the CISO is reporting in the organization? I mean, is this a is this a C-level, kind of boardroom-level uh, position, or are we finding the CISOs reporting into the CIO or under the legal department? or Where, where did you find them sitting? Yeah, yeah, actually, we, we did look at that a little bit. And, you know, we, we did look at that on a lot of depth because we focused more on, you know, not the specific kind of reporting chain, but the activities that they were involved in and, and who they interacted with. Um, well, and a lot of them are all CISOs today, right? A lot of right, them are right, right. Yeah, and a lot of them are right. Exactly, more exactly. Far. And um, so, yeah, you did find a lot. I mean, obviously, reporting to the CIO. Um, you know, when we when we looked at that, uh, you know, you did see some people reporting to CEOs, reporting to CFOs. Um, you know, but what we really, I, I think, learned was um, really that supporting structure uh, around the information security leader. That if you were really confident, if you were in that influencer group. Um, you know, one, you're more likely to have someone like a CISO. You are more likely to have a security and risk committee. Um, you're more likely to have uh, a dedicated budget line item. And I think it was those qualities um, and the fact that you had those, those, those tools available to you, you had those means of communication available to you, I think really improved your confidence, um, you know, for our respondents. So I, I think that was was one of the things, and and the fact that you know with those uh, you know those influencers, those more mature organizations, um, the business leaders were paying more attention, um, you know, and they were more interested, they were more engaged, and I, I think that you know, led a lot to um, that that feeling of maturity, that that feeling of confidence. Um, yeah, and, and I've noticed you and Jack both use kind of that uh, both you know confidence, communication, and education as yeah. kind of some key attributes as you talk about this. Right, right. And and that was one of the things, I mean, that, that kind of progression and that maturity, I think, takes time. And, um, you know, not only for the, the individual responsible for, for security, but also for the organization to, to understand that shift. And, and like you were saying earlier, uh, you know, we actually thought about that a lot and early in the process about the evolution of, like, the CFO, the evolution of the CIO. And, and you know, it was basically a two-decade process for each of those you know, and and moving from a kind of a backroom, highly specialized, highly technical position 
if it was for you know accounting um, you know with the CFO or if it was for you know operating the computer systems with the CIO and you know I, I think that you know we're seeing that same type of evolution um, with information security um, you know just like just like both you and Jack were saying excellent any any closing comments no I mean that, that was really it I, you know I think from you know I think Jack summed it up really nicely but you know, you know, take a look at this report. You know, look at influence. Look at the influencers. See what kind of characteristics and qualities they have, and and uh, you know, see how you can apply it to your your day to day operation. I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, isn't um, heavily, you know, isn't going to cost a lot of money to do. A lot of it's kind of organizational and cultural um, uh, as well. And I, I think that that doing a couple of those things, um, you know, that we've talked about during this conversation, I think can improve your position. All right. Well, that's Jack Danahy uh, from the IBM security team and David Jarvis with the IBM Center for Applied Insights. And uh, once again, their report is available uh, online, and you can find the, um, the link to it uh, in the description of this podcast. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you both for joining. Great. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you for joining the Information Security Podcast. The information contained in these materials is provided for informational purposes only. Nothing contained in these materials is intended to, nor shall have the effect of, creating any warranties or representations from IBM or its suppliers, or altering terms and conditions of any agreements that you have with IBM. The opinions of any insights discussed are those of the presenter and guests, and do not necessarily represent those of the IBM Corporation. All product plans are subject to change without notice. References to IBM products, programs, or services do not imply that they will be available in all countries in which IBM operates. The information contained in this podcast is not intended to imply that any actions taken by you will result in any specific result or benefit. IBM, the IBM logo, and other IBM products and services are trademarks of the International Business Machines Corporation in the United States, other countries, or both. Other company products or service names may be trademarks or service marks of others. Copyright 2012. All rights reserved. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.